Hello, I am Dr. Sherry Parks. I am Vice President of Strategic Initiatives here at MICA. Welcome to the Fall 2020 Rights and Wrongs Mixed Media Lecture Series. This is the first of three events. For the students, remember to use the QR code to receive class credit. This theme entitled Rights and Wrongs, Liberty, Democracy, and the Struggle for Human Rights is explored from a range of perspectives, including the history of race in America and the Black Lives Matter movement, women's suffrage and the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, immigrant rights, public health versus individual liberty, voter rights and voter access, freedom of speech and the arts are other topics and approaches. The faculty sponsor of the Fall 2020 Rights and Wrongs Mixed Media Lecture Series is Lauren Adams, who is MICA faculty in painting. I will be helping to host along with MICA student host, Chloe Green. Chloe? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. So like Dr. Park said, I'm Chloe Green, I use she, her pronouns. I'm a senior general fine arts major with a concentration in curatorial practices and a minor in art history. And I serve as the student life chair for undergraduate SVA, which is the Student Voice Association. And I'm honored to be here today as the student co-host for the mixed media speaker series. So to introduce the panel today, today's panel, we are very fortunate to have Zyveria Simmons and Professor Martha S. Jones, who are two brilliant people who work with the subjects of Black history, culture, and the influence of historical events on the past, present, and future. So we'll be discussing Zyveria's work as an artist and Dr. Jones's work as a historian and how they overlap in their approach to the subjects they focus on and the impacts their work can have. So honoring the theme of this year's speaker series and the current social and political climate, we are thrilled to have Zyveria and Martha here to talk about the cultural and systemic history of human rights in America. So our first speaker is going to be Zyveria Simmons. So I'm just going to read Zyveria's bio and introduce her. So Zyveria Simmons' body of work spans photography, performance, video, sound, sculpture, and installation. She defines her studio practice, which is rooted in an ongoing investigation of experience, memory, abstraction, and present and future histories, specifically shifting notions surrounding landscape as cyclical, whoo, sorry, rather than linear. In other words, Simmons is committed equally to the examination of different artistic modes and processes. For example, she may dedicate part of a year to a photography, another part to performance, and other parts to installation, video, and sound works, keeping her practice in constant and consistent rotation, shift, and engagement. Zyveria Simmons received her BFA from Bard College in 2004 after spending two years on a walking pilgrimage retracing the transatlantic slave trade with Buddhist monks. She completed the Whitney Museum's independent study program in studio art in 2005 while simultaneously completing a two-year actor training conservatory with the Maggie Flanagan Studio. She is a visiting lecturer and the inaugural 2019 Solomon Fellow at Harvard University and will be awarded the Charles Flint Kellogg Award in Arts and Letters from Bard College in summer 2020. In 2019, Zyveria's work included, has been included in over 15 museum exhibitions, including ICA Boston, SF MoMA, the Phillips Collection in DC, the National Museum of Woven in the Arts, Women in the Arts, ooh, forgive me, in DC, Barnes Foundation, and many others. In 2017, Simmons' solo shows include Harvard University and recent museum purchases, also in 2017 including three works acquired by the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Group exhibitions in 2017 include the Wexner Center for the Arts, Prospect for New Orleans, Trusardi Foundation in Milan, Studio Museum in Harlem, in the MICA in MICA, and Chicago and numerous others. In 2015, Simmons was awarded the Foundation for Contemporary Arts, which is the Robert Rauschenberg Grant, 
Simmons has exhibited nationally and internationally where major exhibitions and performances include the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston, the Public Arts Fund, the Sculpture Center, the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum, Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, Institute of Contemporary Art Boston, and Brooklyn Museum, among many others. Her works are also in major museum and private collections, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Nasher Museum, the Rubel Family Collection, UBS, the Guggenheim, the Agnes Gund Art Collection, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, the Studio Museum in Harlem, ICA Miami, High Museum, and Perez Art Museum Miami. So everybody welcomes Iveria. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Chloe, and thank you, Dr. Parks, and thank you, Micah, and of course, especially congratulations, and thank you to Dr. Jones for being here. Obviously, we're celebrating, you know, I'm really excited to be here and also to celebrate your work, um, which is a deep inspiration. I'm kind of like, wow, I'm like a little bit in fan uh, moment, but I'm trying to be present with everyone at the same time. Um, so, I, you know, Micah holds a special place because of the students and a lot of my colleagues um, went through Micah, have taught at Micah, are from the area. So I'm really, you know, it's really exciting to be here. Before I start, start, I'm just going to give a little bit of background on myself um, as a way to talk about what I want to share actually is some, is some text that I've written because I, you know, meditating on um, thinking about Dr. Jones's work and thinking about the interior life of, of women the, and then how that interior life is cultivated uh, through a creative life. So there's the interior life and then there's building into the, the creative life. And um, so a little bit of personal biography about me. Um, I grew up in New York. I'm from Harlem uh, and Queens and I grew up around a lot of women and a lot of women, Black women. I'm a descendant of slavery on all sides of my lineage. And, you know, I grew up with a community of women who were constantly cultivating each other in different ways. Like I remember my aunts having their bus rides or book clubs, or they also had their like kind of, um, they had a club where they would do mutual aid and share resources. And, 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 and there were men around, of course, but the women were kind of like holding the space of like saving money to share share resources or you know creating like moments for us to engage not only politically you know and and creating an awareness of like who we were as black folks you know um my, all my you know ancestors are you know are southern black people so there's a certain culture that i grew up with that even though you know i've you know live in new york i i really relate to that kind of kin folk way that actually activates a political um, engagement inside of myself now. Um, so I just wanted to give that little background of information. And I really wanted to also, you know, formulate this for, for the students, especially because I feel like um, there's so many different ways that we can make artwork, not just through physical objects, but also through our writing, through our speaking. Um, and and, and I, my hope is that especially young folks, you know, work towards having really rich, beautiful, creative lives that are cultivated in all kinds of ways. So I'm going to read, um, I'm going to share my screen and read a section from some work that I wrote uh, about, um, let's see, a year ago a year ago for the Museum of Modern Arts um, magazine. It was, I was asked to kind of write about 24 hours in my day. And what I, what I realized was, well, I'm gonna start reading it, but what I realized was that the way that I thought about my day um, is a way to, again, give you insight into the, my interior life, but also how I cultivate my work and my studio practice, which is, as much deeply tied to the history of art um, and objects as it is to investigating the construction of the United States, the construction of, of capitalism, the construction of 
whiteness, the construction of white supremacy, the construction of the black figure. And, and I'm constantly looking at the data and the statistics and everything that kind of makes us who we are. So I'm gonna take about seven minutes of your time and I'll read through um, and I'm gonna just start with a breath. So if everyone wants to settle in, including myself and land here, and then I'm gonna read from some writing to give a sense of how the political motivation is um, tied to the creative impulse, but also tied to an interior life that I've been cultivating, that I've also recorded um, through my writing and obviously through the output of my artwork. 5.54 a.m. Open my eyes and stare at the blank white wall ahead. Breathe and lie here with the first thoughts that come to mind. Like so many mornings, mornings, thoughts of late, I find myself contemplating, processing a variation on a theme that begins with some form of a similar question. How might the United States or is it United States capitalism be adjusted so that this American constructed racial caste system bends towards something that looks like justice. What methods might we use to stay focused toward political shifts that will change all of our material realities? Something like this. Whenever this type of thought forms in my morning headspace, I usually conclude that at the end of the day, the United States, composed of taxpayers, recent, new, and older immigrants, northerners, midwesterners, southerners, islanders, many corporations, some individuals and their families, most elite educational institutions, many banks, insurance companies, hospitals, textile manufacturers, the tobacco and sugar industries, so many arms of federal, state, and local governments, the Supreme Court has to construct methods of reparation to the descendants of American slavery through acts of Congress, the Senate, and the House of Representatives as a foundational shift towards a new type of country, one that isn't rooted in the supremacy of whiteness, which is clearly what we live with now. And then perhaps more colonial powers will be forced to follow suit, understanding that different groups have different claims on different countries. It doesn't even bother me anymore that this is a 6 a.m. thought. 6 a.m. Breathe. Love up my lover. Light candles throughout the apartment. A daily ritual that from my mother who used to practice a form of Buddhism. Think. I should go, I want to go and see other people's exhibitions today. Though my calendar says I have to remain present to my own studio practice, even though today I would rather see what's happening elsewhere. 7 a.m. Open the windows for the cross breeze. Listen for birds, like the ones I hear when I go upstate, but acknowledge the drilling construction across the street out of my window here in this city. Shower, shea, braid, and unlock hair ritual. Grind espresso beans, froth simple milk, and a place espresso maker on the stove. This is a daily ritual. Write with pen and paper loose thoughts for the day. Or at least, I try to read the headlines, or at least short narratives found online. Peek at, but mostly avoid social media. Say goodbye to the lover sometime around this time. Loose thoughts. What time is our flight to Milan? Which projects need the most attention today? Why are there so many homeless Black people in New York City, in Los Angeles? Are they mostly part of that first or second generation whose lineage is drawn from Southern sharecroppers, two or three generations from American slavery? America, to this minute, has an abysmal, segregated, and subpar educational system across the board keeping human beings in constructed but real categories as oppressors and oppressed. Some folks leave high school not knowing how to read. Most of those some folks are Black American folks. Think about how without an overhaul on the distribution of wealth, resources, and education, the growth of quote unquote minority communities actually equals more low wage labor force for our capitalist system. 
lower wage underpaid workers are being replaced by lower, lower wage workers. No one thrives in this model except the institutions, corporations, and their directors. Non-random thoughts. Do white people know they are only white here in America as a way to gain and use the advantages of America and also to be a part of the social structures that have systemically oppressed black people who can trace their lineage back to American slavery, slavery as well as First Nations populations whose ancestors were the original occupants and poor brown communities across the nation and beyond. Whiteness operates to oppress. Loose thoughts. Are there actual farmers at the farmer's market today? 10 a.m. Walk over the bridge. I need some Toni Morrison talking through these headphones while I walk these four miles. 11 a.m. Board meeting. We have an urgent issue on our hands. Keenly aware that on this board, like most of the ones I sit on, I am the only American person whose ancestors have lived here for three, almost four centuries, whose father was a sharecropper from Georgia, and whose entire lineage on all sides is some kind of quote, mixed, quote unquote, race slave group, uh, mixed race group built by American slavery. I hold that position on most of the boards that I sit on. Boards are slow to bring on new people. That's another thing to work toward. I note that fact most times I walk into these boardrooms. I note that to myself, obviously, always aware of the figure in space. America doesn't know people as daughters of sharecroppers or as descendants of American slavery. I mean, we know, but we don't really know. Like if there are descendants of slavery, then there are descendants of planters and plantation owners. As a collective, the people of the United States do not understand their own narrative. Our collective narrative doesn't really account for the white people, their children, and so on across the country who oppress Negroes for centuries like so right now. Like the shop owners who lynched and burned down whole black towns or the building owners who discriminated just an hour ago or the long line of governors who advocated for racist policies, or the doctors who, because they didn't or don't like this or that Negro, let this or that Negro die a slow, painful death when they could have saved the soul. Like what happened to Eric Dolphy in Berlin happened every day all over the United States for centuries till this day. We still live with these white people today and they had children and grandchildren who surely haven't as a collective shaken off all of their parents' and grandparents' ways, views, and attitude. Negro, colored, Black, African-American, person of color are titles that do not get to the heart of the matter. America only knows people like me as Black people or people of color. I strongly object to being labeled the blank term people of color. Right. Thank you, Zyveria, so much. Have you Is that everything you wanted to say? Okay. Thank you. So that was, oh, that was beautiful. I can't wait to talk about it. Okay. <laughs> so for our next guest, Martha, I'm going to read her bio and then she will talk to us for about 15 minutes. So for Martha's bio, Professor Martha S. Jones is the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor and a Professor of History at the Johns Hopkins University. She is a legal and cultural historian whose work examines how Black Americans have shaped the story of American democracy. Professor Jones is the author of Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All, which was published in this year, 2020 and Birthright Citizens, A History of Race and Rights in Antebellum America in 2018. She is the winner of the Organization of American Historians Liberty Legacy Award for the best book in civil rights history, the American Historical Association Littleton Griswold, Award, Griswold Prize for the best book in American legal history, and the American Society for Legal History John Philip Reed Book Award for the best book in Anglo-American legal history. 
Professor Jones is also an author of All Bound Up Together, The Women Question in African American Public Culture, 1830 through 1900, which was published in 2007, and a co-editor of Toward an Intellectual History of Black, Woman, Black Women, which is published through the University of North Carolina Press in 2015, together with many important articles and an essay. So Professor Jones is a public historian frequently writing for broader audiences at the Washington Post, The Atlantic, USA Today, Public Books, The Chronicle of Higher Education, and Time. And she's also written a curatorship for museum exhibitions, including Reframing the Color Line and Proclaiming Emancipation in conjunction with the William L. Clements Library and Museum, Film, and Video Productions in the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery the Charles Wright Museum of African American History, PBS, the American Experience, the Southern Poverty Law Center, Netflix, and Art in France. Professor Jones holds a PhD in history from Columbia University and a, GD, and a JD from the CUNY School of Art, School of Law, sorry. Prior to the start of her academic career, she was a public interest litigator in New York City, recognized for her work at at a Charles H. Rivzon Fellow on the Future of the City of New York at Columbia University. So Professor Jones currently serves as a co-president of the Berkshire Conference of Women's Historians and on the executive board of the Society of American Historians. So thank you for being here, Martha. Take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Chloe. Um, thank you to everybody there at MICA. Um, my neighbors um, in Baltimore City. I'm coming to you from uh, my home in Baltimore, and it's wonderful to be with you. Thank you to you, Chloe, for um, all of your work, and to you and Dr. Sherry Parks for um, hosting us today. Um, I'm just going to fangirl right back and say um, that, you know, to Zaveria, I, I, I just um, am in huge admirer um, and it's a real honor to be with you. Um, that alone would be enough, but I'm especially grateful for um, the generosity um, of the conversation because um, your work um, inspires and challenges and um, moves me in ways that um, I hope um, shows in at least small ways in the, the kind of work that I do. So um, thank you so much for um, sharing this afternoon with me. Um, as Chloe said, um, I think I'm here in part because I published a book this fall on the history of um, black women um, and voting rights um, that uh, in part turns on the story of the ratification of the 19th amendment. We sit here at in the 100th anniversary year of that amendment to the Constitution. Um, but perhaps it won't surprise many of you that that history um, turned out to me, uh, turned out to be um, less than bounded by the conventional stories about um, women in the vote that somehow begin in a small village in upstate New York um, and a gathering that produces a declaration of sentiments and the story that often ends with the 19th Amendment. Um, my story turned out to be a 200 year look at the ways in which um, Black American women um, not only develop a politics of voting rights, but develop an inner life and an intellectual life um, that really sets a high bar for American politics that precedes meetings like those in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848 and extends far beyond the ratification of the 19th Amendment, um, I think arguably until um, this very uh, moment um, where we sit two weeks from a fateful um, election, Black women still um, defining the high bar, um, making the difference and showing us a way forward through very troubled times. I thought I'd say a little bit about the, the origins of this book um, because it might just give us some uh, common ground for conversation today. Um, and the first is um, my projects um, oftentimes originate out of a question or a puzzle that I have. Um, but in order to 
commit myself to um, what is oftentimes a many year long um, combination of research and writing, um, something really has to be um, on my nerves. <laughs> and, um, and this book is no exception to um, uh, my attempt to um, resolve something that uh, troubled me. And that trouble began a few uh, years ago when, as we were already anticipating this anniversary year of the 19th Amendment, um, a friend shared with me plans for um, what was to be a monument in New York City's Central Park that would honor um, the early activists um, that had, uh, in essence, given us um, women's votes in the United States. And um, I'm a New Yorker too, so I, I, you know, I have my own sort of claim to the space of Central Park and a lot of thoughts about um, what is there and what is not. But this particular monument um, uh, set off alarm bells because it featured um, two figures, um, two women, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, figures um, who are very much part of the lore of women's rights and women's votes in the United States. Um, but most importantly for me as a historian of Black women, as a Black woman myself, I realized that we were about to careen into an anniversary year where even in New York City Central Park, much of which sits um, in our home borough of Harlem, um, it was possible for um, designers and fundraisers and city officials um, to imagine that monument without an African-American woman um, on it. Um, and um, I am not a monument designer, um, and I don't envy people who take on sort of the monumental landscape, but particularly in um, a political moment when we know far too much about what is troubled when it comes to monuments. Um, but I did weigh in with the thing I do, uh, the tools I do have, um, my pen, um, paper, um, and history, um, and um, offered up an intervention that suggested um, at least that monument should include another um, great uh, New York figure, um, that of Sojourner Truth, um, the formerly enslaved woman um, who herself left an extraordinary mark on the early history of women's rights, anti-slavery, and a great deal more. Um, and that monument, as many of you may know, went through um, a number of revisions and was unveiled in August of 2020. Um, now with the figure of Sojourner Truth, um, uh, present along with Stanton and Anthony. Folks have asked me whether I'm satisfied and whether that's enough and I fall back on the view that I am no designer of monuments um, and that my tool, my instrument in this debate really was the book um, that I wrote um, and it is a very different sort of enterprise to have 120,000 words um, rather than a modestly sized uh, granite plinth um, as your tableau. Um, and so the book I've written is very much a response to my encounter um, with the plans for that monument. Um, at the same time, um, I'm someone who, um, as I think you can see oh, over here, um, I work in an office at home um, on which uh, the walls include portraits, um, portraits of the women in my family, um, forebears going back, um, I'm not very good at this, it's like this, um, including this one, um, which is my great, great, great grandmother, Nancy Bell Graves, um, who was born enslaved um, in the first decade of the 19th century in Danville, Kentucky. And the women on this wall include um, Nancy's daughters and granddaughters and great granddaughters. And um, I'm someone very much accountable um, in my work to these women, um, to their lives, um, but also their, um, uh, now gentle um, but ever-present um, critique um, their insistence that I do justice um, to a history um, and that I do justice to it um, from their point of view. And so this book um, was very much written um, with women like those in my family and many hundreds and thousands of others in mine, um, Black women, many of whom are descended from slaves or enslaved themselves, um, who build a political movement um, who build a political critique um, that um, first and foremost 
um, decries um, the twin scourges of racism and sexism and the role um, that those um, ideas have played in American um, culture, law, politics, and more. Um, Vanguard was written um, very much with um, their uh, perspectives in mind. And for folks who have a chance to read the book, you'll um, discover a little bit of um, the research I did to discover their stories because in many ways this was a book that was intended to fill for me um, a series of silences, um, including silences about the women in my own family. Um, I had not inherited stories about who they were in the story of American politics or voting rights. Um, my own journey includes some disappointments and the things I can't know as a historian, um, but also some, as my grandmother um, uh, related in an essay, um, she, on an interview she gave back in the 70s, a lot of thrilling encounters with the women in my family and how they fit into the story of um, American politics. I think there's a double-edged um, quality to my work in this book, and perhaps it runs through much of what I do. Um, and maybe that's no mistake. I come by it honestly, um, as we say. Um, you know, I was at one time a public interest lawyer in New York City where um, my work was to um, tell the stories of um, the people who were my clients, um, uh, in ways that were direct, that were true, um, that were unflinching. Um, and yet I was somebody whose work also demanded that I, um, that I retell, um, that I translate, um, that I make those stories do work um, in courtrooms and in front of judges and lawyers and, um, and spectators um, who did not share um, either my client's perspectives or um, uh, a sympathy. Um, for the kinds of um, concerns that my clients brought into a courthouse. And, and today I think my work, um, uh, uh, we saw an image of, of Toni Morrison, um, and, and Morrison really, um, and my, my great teacher, um, Farah Jasmine Griffin, Griffith at um, Columbia University, um, you know, these are women who taught me, um, who admonished me to, um, keep Black women, their experiences, their ideas, um, their concerns, their activism, and more at the center um, of everything I do. And in this book, I have endeavored to do that. Um, and at the same time, I do hope that this is um, a project that um, reaches the eyes and the ears of um, many Americans, of of goodwill and otherwise, um, who did not learn Black women's history um, in their classrooms, um, be it their elementary and K through 12 classrooms or their college classrooms and more. Um, so I think I'm still speaking uh, and working um, through those two perspectives um, all the time. Um, and, uh, and maybe I'll stop there and just say thank you again for the opportunity to be with you all today. And um, I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much for that, Martha. You actually answered one of the burning questions I had for a Q&A, so thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, oh, don't even worry about it. It's perfect. So I'll go ahead and pass it to Sherry, who's going to talk about our Q&A structure coming up. Thank you, Chloe, and thank you to, to both Martha and Siberia for those wonderful presentations. So let me tell you what the next hour, um, and that's about it, what we have is, is going to look like. Um, first, the four of us will talk. Um, Chloe has created some wonderful questions. And um, so I'm, we're gonna showcase Chloe's questions and I may flit in and out um, if, if there's room. Um, and then in the second half hour, uh, the Q&A will be up. So if you're on Facebook, you can, answer, you can enter your questions there. If you're on this chat, there's a Q&A function that you can use. And you can go ahead, if, as you wish, to go ahead and start lining those questions up. And we'll, we'll take as many as we can um, in the second half hour. And, but first, the four of us get, get to talk to each other, which we're all, I think, looking forward to. And so I'm going to hand it back <laughs> to, to Chloe. 
Right. Thank you so much, Sherry. So I will go ahead and start with the first question. I'm extending this to Siberia and to Martha. So could we start off by talking about the ways history and like the subjects of history are handled in art versus academics. So Xyveria, how do you as an artist approach history? And Martha, how do you approach it as an academic and a historian? Um, I, I can start first. Um, for me, I mean, history is the, I hope I'm seeing you, it's, you know, with all the Zoom, I'm like, am I looking straight at you? <laughs> um, for me, you know, history is my foundation. I realized, I think I was in like second grade or third grade and I won the social studies award. And I, and I realized I'm the same person. Like I've, I've consistently looked to history to try to understand where I am and where I'm going. Um, and I've also consistently looked to researchers. Actually, at this point, I look to what Martha does, what, you know what I'm saying? I look to the historians to help guide me make objects, to help me, you know, make photographs, to make installations, to make performances, actually to make um, choreographic works. For me, um, history, language, they are foundational to how I can even embed um, these, these, these things, these dis different things with meaning, um, you know, there's a there's a there's a trend towards looking at archives and for me particularly my work um, you know having gone into archives gone into the Museum of Modern Arts archives having gone into uh, the Radcliffe uh, archives I obviously recognize that in terms of black black people there's a there's so many holes in the narrative and I have to kind of constantly draw from a what's part of the public record and then be what's missing. And so I look to historians particularly um, to help me understand what's missing. And then I have a series of works called Sundown and the Sundown series is really about <laughs> basically four to 500 years of trying to understand a narrative, but through so many lives that I feel like were either uh, lost because they were laboring instead of being able to have the leisure time to make things or um, their narratives weren't, you know, they weren't able to express themselves creatively in the ways that I am now. So I'm kind of constructing a lot of characters based on the holes within the narratives and using historical, uh, you know, data, statistics, um, imagery, language uh, impulses to create that body of work. And so that's a body of work that'll be, you know, going on for a long period of time. Um, and if anyone can just look up my name and sundown and you'll start to see that work. Um, and it's for me, it's, I want it to be the record of my, one of the foundational records of my practice, because I, when I pass away at whatever point that is, I want my children, your children, my cousins, every, all the next generation, I want them to understand the history here very clearly so that there's no confusion. Visually, I want you to be able to look at my work as one road into the history here. And obviously there's many roads, but there's some truths to the, to the history in this country that I think we have to continually um, hold in order for us to move to another space. So that's the long short of it. Um, I think, uh, you know, I've been trying to think um, analogously, maybe that's a mistake in this kind of conversation, but I do think that there's something about um, sort of the medium in, in which we work and that, you know, for the historian or at least a historian like me, um, the medium is the archive, um, first and foremost, and, um, and in many ways, the kinds of stories I can tell, the kind of analysis I can offer is constrained by um, the capacity of um, the archive as a medium for, um, for telling those stories. And um, that means, um, I think, in some ways that while um, 
I begin with imagination. Um, I begin with um, uh, a notion of what I'd like to tell. Um, part of my work is to wrestle um, with the violence, um, the incompleteness, the silence and more. Um, because in my work, that is, in fact, that silence is an artifact um, of the past. It is an artifact of racism, is an artifact of enslavement, is an artifact of Black women's lives and the ways in which um, structurally um, and in lived experience, we are oftentimes kept at a consequential distance from the archive. Um, and so um, I think in some ways, um, you know, I'm somebody with, um, a, a, you know, a kind of envy or, uh, you know, and maybe a nicer way to put it feels like I'm very much working in a way that's complementary um, to a whole range of creative um, arts that um, are able to um, speak to the whole, speak to the silences in ways that um, my work um, doesn't. Um, and at the same time, um, there's no question, and, and for anybody who's followed, for example, the, um, the very serious tussle over something like the New York Times is uh, 1619 uh, project, um, a project that I very much admire, and it's, um, its leader, Nicole Hannah-Jones, someone whom I very much admire. There's no question but that um, politics, um, that history takes um, my work very close to politics, um, and we understand the ways in which um, historical narratives, historical interpretation, um, done well, done poorly, and otherwise, are um, undergird a great deal of the ways in which we see the world, make sense of the world. You know, even when I was a lawyer, you know, I was a sort of historian and a storyteller and the ways in which law's logics um, worked was in part um, by way of um, a notion of what history um, could tell us, what we could know about the past. Um, so I'm mindful of the ways in which um, while I think like any creative person, I don't control the way in which folks make use of my work, um, the ways in which they wield it in the real world for other purposes. Um, I write with a, um, a strong sense that, um, uh, that there is a profound politics to what I do, whether it is um, the politics of archival practices that have um, devalued um, and overlooked for too long in our history, um, the past of Black Americans and our the record um, of our lives, our ideas, and more. Whether it's the politics of academia, and um, you know who gets the endowed chair or the seat at the table or the book contract and all those things that are the imprimatur, um, or it is the ways in which. Um, you know, a, the um, current White House um, could uh, convene uh, an official uh, gathering on the topic of early American history um, and um, never imagine that someone like me or the kind of work I do um, would have a place at that table. Um, all of those are um, an important part of what I do, um, even as even if at the core, I am a storyteller um, out of the archive. Amazing. Okay, thank you both so much. This is what, I love the way that both of your work overlaps and that you are exploring these subjects, trying to figure out where they're coming from, like understanding them and then learning about them. Um, so on that topic, I thought I would turn and ask one question that, um, Zyberia expressed that she really wanted to discuss and get your input on Martha. So thinking about these subjects of history, the politics, the social cultural conditions that they created and trying to make people aware. I mean, that's a huge issue that's been coming up this year is trying to educate people and make them aware and trying to reverse these issues. So Last year, Zyveria responded to critics who called the 2019 Whitney Biennial not radical enough. 
um, with a very beautifully written article where she made the point that whiteness must undo itself in order to make true radical change in contemporary culture. So Zyveria, if you want to talk a little bit more about that with the audience, um, with all of us here, and then Martha, if you would please weigh in, how could you talk about how this um, reversal and radical change would take place on an academic level? Sure. Um, so I wrote that article in direct response to writings by critics who were writing about the, the biennial. That was the kind of like the most diverse, uh, ethnically, racially diverse biennial that the Whitney Museum had. And I kept reading, and the cura one of the curators is um, uh, Black American. And, um, you know, I kept reading the reviews and reading how these critics, most white, most, you know, above 50, you know, which is fine, but, you know, at a certain, you know, kind of like, socioeconomic place and also a place in their work were kind of really taking the task, um, these artists and the pressure that they put on these young black artists in particular to, they, they kept saying how disappointed they were that the work wasn't radical enough. And, and, and I remember I, I was, I was in my apartment in LA at the time and I was, I was feverishly writing on my, on my iPhone and I was like, every review was just like, the show is not radical enough. Why isn't there more risk taking? I remember a show that was done in the 80s when it was, you know, when, when this activist group came in or that activist group came in. And, and I finally was like, you know what, I'm, I'm good with these reviews. What I want to know is why aren't you taking a risk as a, a you know, well-to-do, you know, white writer who can, who can take on critique of these young folks who are a <laughs> saddled with massive amounts of student debt. So what, you know, when you understand the art market, you understand that these young folks are putting themselves through school, taking on this massive debt to make this work and be, they finally get to this place within this hollowed institution and they are expected to basically undo in one exhibition, basically 400 years of, of oppression and and wow the masses simultaneously and I, this is an impossible feat i think that you know something uh you said chloe which i really it's something in my biography that i want to take out and, and i think it's actually something that you said dr jones which is um you said uh the fake praise of firsts and i and and that's something that i'm really interested i don't like that. I don't like inaugural. I don't like being the first. I'm because A, that's a shame. B, I'm not. <laughs> C, it's a way. I understand the ways in which that mechanism makes people continue to go on a train of like trying to achieve. Um, and so for me, it just, it, you know, I had to write the text because I, I had to understand what risk I could take next in terms of my language and also how I could move the needle forward for the conversations that need to be have, had, which is ultimately when you talk about resources and you talk about Black America, ultimately white people are 70% of the population, the Black American population that descends from slavery is about 14%. There's no way, at the end of the day, as fabulous and radical as we are, we, white, for me, in very plain terminology, whiteness has to undo itself in all the different ways that whiteness gets to control narrative have resources down to the onions that you use to cook your food or the threads on my clothing or the reviews of a um a show with with young black folks so that was kind of the impetus for the writing and i would love to hear any thoughts you have because that's kind of what I keep pushing up against as a contemporary artist and what I've taught when I've taught also. Yeah. Um, two things come to mind. You know, the first is um, a lesson that comes from uh, the legal scholar, um, Derek Bell, who 
um, many people have read in part because Bell's um, craft extended to the writing of science fiction and allegory as he wrestled with the, um, what he deemed to be the permanence of race and racism in American law. Um, but Bell's um, analysis um, in part turns on what he calls interest convergence. You know, and he says, you know, nothing moves forward um, for black folk in the US um, unless it dovetails with the interests of whites. Um, that that's the way we have to understand progress. And his example is the, um, is Brown versus Board of Education, which he explains is not a function of sort of white America's sort of um, new enlightenment about the trouble of race and racism and a reversal of that at all, but it is a sort of self-serving moment in which during the Cold War, it's necessary for the U.S. to give up, in essence, Jim Crow in order to be a, um, a credible uh, and viable um, contested, right, for world domination that includes many black and brown people across the globe. Um, so there's a way in which, you know, those two things are, are inextricably linked, I think, in Bell's view, in a more pernicious way, even than you've suggested, um, that in fact, it is um, only by appealing to the interests of white people that then black people move anywhere. Um, that having been said, I, I've, I've felt a little inspired in these weeks. Um, I've spent a lot of time traveling. Like, I don't travel anywhere, let me be honest. I sit right here and I talk to people on Zoom. But you know what I mean. I travel metaphorically <laughs> to many places and I've been talking to many audiences about not only the history of the 19th Amendment, which includes, importantly, the open secret white suffragists know that black women, too many black women in the US will remain without the right to vote after the federal amendment is ratified because Jim Crow laws are now gonna disenfranchise black women in the ways they've been long disenfranchising black men. So, you know, I've had people say to me things like, well, you know, what can we do here in 2020 to help black women, you know, exercise their full influence on American politics. And it's a little bit like your point, you know, and I think, actually, I think, you know, black women are doing their work, right? Have done their work for a hundred years plus. Um, not only do we vote as a block, um, we, we vote disproportionately, we turn out disproportionately to other um, American constituencies. I think, I think actually you should study black women if, if, if you're going to attend to that at all. But more to the point, I've been asking myself if this isn't the year, right, for white American women um, to do that kind of self-examination and ask what would it be like if in this election cycle, white women did not split, right, across the parties and between the candidates and in essence nullify their influence on the outcome? What would it be like if white American women in this year voted beyond their parochial um, or simple interests and looked to the interests of the, the mass of humanity in this country, and some people might say in the world, um, and use their vote to actually determine the outcome in two weeks um, at the poll. That is my version, I guess, of what you suggest, right? Which is that rather than worrying about black women's politics, um, it, this is the year where white American women actually have the opportunity to attend to their own politics as women um, and as far uh, minded, right, uh, women um, who, perhaps have finally learned how to use the influence they have on election day to change the course of this country for all of us and not only for themselves. Um, that's my challenge. Um, it, that might be the equivalent of your piece about the, um, about the uh, Whitney exhibition. So I barely, you want to say something back, yes. Oh, no, I, I just want to say, you know, going off of what you said, Dr. Jones, is that that is, I agree with you, and that's, I, I honestly have gotten to the place in my, you know, thinking about your work and thinking about so many amazing works, but particularly this book that you've written now, I realized, 
And this is something that Simone Lee, the artist, had, had on her mask head one uh, for a little while. She said, we have tried everything. And I realized, thinking of the lineage that I come from, thinking of the community of Black women that I talk to every day, um, we have done it. We have done it all. We've done everything. I do not blame, actually, Black folks for anything anymore. I've gotten to this place where I'm like, this has nothing to do with white or with black people. This has to do with how white people, foundational white people, immigrated by white people, white people in Europe, how you, it's a moral, spiritual, resource-based conversation, really that you need to have because we are actually good. And I, and I realized that when I think historically through my own personal family history, and then I realized that when I think about the, this moment right now, and you four beautiful Black women, and, you know, the Black women that are surround me when I leave, you know, the studio, right? Like, there's a, there's, a, there's a wholeness that Black women have that I think because of what has happened here generationally, we don't, we know, we recognize, but because of resources, we have to struggle against these other things. But actually, Black folks in general have done, as I, I'm gonna use my slang, we've done the damn thing here. It is up to the white population to get it together. We've done it, we did it. You, there's no, now we're just going through. So that's that. I just wanted to agree with you in my slang word language. <laughs> so I, I want to tell people that if they want if they want to ask a question, to go ahead and write them in. But in the meantime, we're going to keep talking. So I'm going to I'm going to ask a question. And first, you I have to say that there is a T-shirt, and actually the the immediate past uh, president of the Michael's board is a, is a white woman, and she has it, and it says, "I vote like a black woman." Mm -hmm. um, and, and that really is, is what you're talking about, is, is interrogating one's own whiteness. And you remind me of a study that recently found that, that uh, of white progressives, they, they worry more that other white people will find them racist than they do that black people will find them racist. And that really speaks to, I think, your, your, uh, your view of, of, of what's going on. I, I, but, and you're right, this is a luxury for all of us to be on this panel you know, with each other. And so I want to dig in with a question, if I may, Chloe. Um, I, I love the, 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 the phrase cultivating each other, of Black women cultivating each other mm -hmm. and doing all of this work. And there's a recent study that says that Black teenage girls do that. They work on each other. And I, I would love to hear a conversation between the two of you of that work of cultivating each other that we know that Black women do and how that how that rises into the larger public sphere where we take, mm -hmm. um, take their methods. I, I, Eleanor Holmes Norton said, uh, and tell them that they already know how to younger black women. And so can you talk about how that, uh, that, that path from cultivating each other and th that work and how that shows up in, in the public sphere for each of you? I think if I could, um, I'd like to um, use that as an opening to talk about um, the community of Black women historians um, in which I, you know, came of age and, um, uh, you know, with whom, um, you know, I build my ideas and my ambition um, and on whose shoulders I stand um, every day. Um, because, uh, you know, there's a fiction in um, the kind of work I do, which is that um, somebody puts your words between two covers and uh, puts your name on the front and people think you wrote this book, right? That this was your idea. And um, this book, more than any other, I keep saying to people, please read the footnotes. <laughs> it's not what people like to read. I understand that. But I want folks to appreciate that um, I've written a book that stands on the shoulders of three generations of Black women's historians, not to mention right, 200 years of Black women's writing 
um, 200 years of their um, producing an archive from which I can write. Um, and um, I couldn't do this work otherwise. And that's in part because that's the community um, that validates and affirms um, my, my inklings, my instincts, my aspirations, my dreams. Um, but also it's because the community that teaches me then how to take those aspirations and those dreams and transform them into, you know, the hard won um, book um, between the covers. And um, I've been, I work with wonderful graduate students at Johns Hopkins who have really taught me a lot about my field. And part of what I've learned just in these last years working with them are the ways in which long before there was such a thing as history um, as we know it as an academic endeavor, um, long before there was a field that was recognized as um, African-American women's history. And I'm old enough to remember when that literally becomes a Library of Congress category, right, and gets that kind of stamp of acknowledgement, um, that Black women, have, we have been writing our history from a very, for a very long time, whether it's the um, slave narrative of, of Harriet Jacobs um, or Anna Julia Cooper's A Voice from the South, um, uh, on and on, um, you know, the memoirs of Ida Wells and Mary Church Terrell and many others that Black women have been using um, a whole range of genre, right, to write that history um, so that someone like me could come behind um, and produce a book like Vanguard. Um, and, um, and I've spoken already about these women who hang on my wall over here. You know, and and uh, and they're with me all the time, um, chiding me and encouraging me, but um, most often letting me know when I get it right. Um, and um, so um, I am the beneficiary of of that spirit, right, of cultivating one another. And um, and I hope I know how to um, pass it on 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 good days to others. I think you do. Samiria, how does it show up in, in your world? I mean, on a really beautiful note, um, you know, my best friend's grandmother was Elizabeth Catlett, and that's mm -hmm. such a, you know, privileged position to be in, right? Like, I met Elizabeth, you know, as sassy as she wanted to be, you know, you know, it, you know a long time ago. Um, I've stayed in her house in Mexico, um, so, you know, I have this like rich, not only do I have beautiful black girlfriends who are, you know, creatives, actors, thinkers, historians, doctors, all of these, but I have a rich um, community of, of, of women artists who've, who've constantly held me, who've guided me, who've, I mean, in terms of Elizabeth's um, grand daughters, um, you know, they've let me into her archives. I've seen like things that no one could, see, you know, the book collection, all of the, 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 the like ephemera that is inside of her studio with her husband that she shared. So for me, I have, there's that. Then there's obviously the artists who have like raised me, you know, in terms of people like Lorna Simpson, like Carrie Mae Weems, um, like Deb Willis, you know, um, these people, you know, taught me before they knew me, you know, they inspired me to, to engage and produce and to try to understand and be hardcore and be rigorous and be, you know, in Carrie's case, be sensual and, and again, sassy, you know, and, and, and outspoken. So they've created a foundation. And then there's my contemporary artists, you know, I mean, again, I mentioned Simone, I mentioned, you know, Deanna Lawson, there's um, Micheline Thomas, there's, um, you know, so, I mean, there's so many people that are, you know, what, you know, whether we're speaking regularly or we're speaking occasionally or we're exhibiting together. I mean, these are people who I think about, whose works I, you know, admire, who I want to engage with. So um, in, in that way, I think there's like a, a close uh, kind of cultivation. There's obviously my family and, 
And then there's like a mental and then a distance cultivation. And then there's the archives and the, the women who've been writing and, and making photographs and making paintings for, for centuries who I'm always looking to, to inspire my work. Um, I'm always trying to understand deeper. Um, and then, you know, there's the broader context of, of, of just black, I, be, because the United States is actually, the history here is not that long. You know what I mean? It's not like an endless 5,000 year. It is in terms of the indigenous narrative, but in terms of the black American experience, because it's not that long, I feel very close to this country and the people, all of the people who, especially those who descend from slavery, that, that long lineage, I feel very close to it because it's the, these are the narratives that my family told me about. So I feel connected to the whole group of women who have that shared lineage and can share certain stories that are just part of our culture, that a, that, that a culture that pretty much wouldn't exist had the United States not built itself the way it did. And so we have a shared conversation that I'm nurtured from. Like I, I, I noticed Dr. Parks when I was talking about, you know, my aunts and the house and, you know, like my aunties having their like money changing parties and their bus rides. And, you know, I mean, you were laughing and, and cause you know, you know, I, I don't even, I could just say it like in a clipped, language that's a comfort that's a that's a that's a cultivation that is something i will never forget and i hope that i you know i was texting with one of my students who's you know former students who's trying to get into grad school and she's amazing and i was like you've got to you've got to you got to move through you got to do this you got to you know just like a sister you know what i'm saying i mean yes she was my student but i see her as a, a a friend as a sister i'm like okay i need you to expand on this vocabulary and that vocabulary and i mean in that way i try to keep you know the the lines of communication open so that i'm cultivating these young folks to to take the risks and to speak and to do what they want to do and to recognize that you can actually take risks and you can actually push to do it's a it's a push here in this country <laughs> it's not but but it is possible you know and I, and that's something that i hope that i'm cultivating and that only the only way i could do that is by the group of women that have cultivated me in all the different ways that i tried to explain and if I take I add one more thing, oh, I please. I just because I have to, um, it, it feels important. Um, you know, I'm somebody, if you ask me um, where you worship, which is to say, where do you go for your spiritual um, sustenance? Um, it is to the museum, it's to the gallery. Um, so for me, Black women artists, you know, are that place where I go and my family knows I will, I will drag you on the Eurostar to, to see one piece, right? Um, because we must, we must do that. We must do the ritual and then we must take from that. And so um, I think it's really humbling to reflect on how um, indebted I feel um, to black women artists who um, represent us, who interpret us, um, who show us ourselves, um, who celebrate us, and a great deal more, um, that for someone like me, um, there's no subject, it's one of the hardest things about the, you know, the COVID times, right, is that um, I can't head up on the shuttle to the BMA and walk through those galleries and encounter the, the beauty and the brilliance um, and the provocation and more that, um, black women artists have um, offered to all of us, um, me included. So sorry, I just had to say that because no, that's no, really no, the answer. Yeah, you're <laughs> you. right. That that was very important. I just wanted to point out to the audience that often, you know, we think of this concept of mag magical realism, but what both of you are describing is that black people, black women, move with with this emotional culture that supports them. And since the ancestors are really important, that emotional culture includes the ancestors and your girlfriends and your children and 
And, and I think if you take um, that and add it to what Martha said with, with the Black women historians, that that supplants and replaces the structural supports that are not there mm -hmm. for Black people. That's, that's the, the piece that holds you up. I mean, I'm, I'm giving your words back to you that, that mm -hmm. lifts us up and holds us up and sustains us and says, this is what you need to do to get into graduate school because you, I'm not your, I am not your professor anymore. I am your mentor that is going to help you move into that. And that is, that is how we stay alive. I'm going to hand it back to Chloe now, uh, who has I, <laughs> has more questions than she's going to get to ask. <laughs> oh yeah, thank you. I was just sitting here soaking up all the wisdom happening right now. Like, <laughs> amazing. Um, oh gosh. I know you've got a triage. Which one do you really want to ask? <laughs> um, let's see. I might take a little bit of a personal route, ask a question that is a little relevant to me, and I know a lot of my peers that are up in this Zoom today. Um, so we're at MICA's art school. Students here are making work for all kinds of reasons. Um, some people here are using it for um, intellectual purposes, for research purposes, and then there's some students who are making the work um, just for uh, that no matter what kind of work you're making, it's all inherently political. So I thought I would maybe throw out that question, see if we could talk about the idea. Zyberia, you may want to talk about this first. And Martha, you... it's all art inherently political and considering the impacts of art and especially of research and academics, like should all art be political? <laughs> I mean, I'm curious to hear Dr. Jones's uh, assessment. I'm going to actually keep it brief because I want to hear, I think, this <laughs> legend, I don't need to talk. But I will say, um, Richard Serra, Matthew Barney, uh, Jason Rhodes, Dash Stone. Those people are all making politically engaged work. What they are doing, Jackson Pollock. I don't care. You can you can give me a whole host of of white male artists. Think of the political time that they they were working. The United States is a political environment. It's a. I have this. this there's a paper that was written that I named a piece of work called "The Whole United States is Southern." Mm -hmm. The United States is a political project with very clear political desires. Thus far, I wish it would change. For me, if you, if I'm going to focus this on white artists, white artists are basically deciding whether they want to focus on the the entire body politic or they want to focus on their interior life and its expressions. Either which way, that, is a, that, that becomes a political decision and it also activates or deactivates what's happening outside of the studio. So for me, actually, I can't, I can't unsee the political climate that works are made in. So if you think of someone like Richard Serra, for instance, dealing with the materials that he did as a white man in the 60s who was surrounded by a civil rights movement in overdrive 60s 70s the he was living in new york city where the conditions of black people are not that similar are not that dissimilar to now during covid he made conscious choices to work with materials that were large and expensive and um, not really that accessible to black artists and not saying he necessarily was thinking of those things, but the fact that he wasn't thinking of those things means that he made a political decision to take that content out. And so for me, I can't look at any of the artists, especially when times have been active, such as now, um, without trying to understand where they are positioning themselves politically. So. I would say most, most all art 
involves a political decision mm -hmm. of some kind. It's just which layer of the politic you want to kind of address. And, and I think most white artists historically have made decisions to not engage straightforward politics and they've also not engaged whiteness, right? There, there's no like long history of, of white contemporary art where there's like a conversation around what it means to be a white person in the United States. And that there's, there's something missing there. There's a whole genre of work missing. There's, it's not talked about in, 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 in art historical circles or art contemporary art circles. So for me, that's how I answer it. And, and you can also tie it to the materials. For instance, if you look in my studio, to make a photograph, I have to work, I work with a white printer, you know? <laughs> There's not like tons of black printers who are master printers who also work with like Irving Penn so that I can like get that knowledge into my work, you know? Or, you know, my assistant was actually an, uh, an older black woman. So amazing, I'm lucky, you know? But that's, that's like very rare. You know, every little decision that an artist makes is tied to the greater capitalist economy. And oftentimes you, there's so many holes because of our culture and, and it's, it's carceral construction. There's holes in like, you know, who, who you hire to produce, fabricate, install these works, assist you with all of these things. Most white artists I know do not have a lot of black folks that are their assistants inside of their studios. Once again, that means that they are not lifting the material conditions of black folks in this country, which is bizarre because black folks have traditionally had these skills that are now being lost to us because we can't get the job. So it's, it's, it's so complicated, but yes, it's all political. <laughs> um, so I'll say that, um, I mean, I think one of the ways in which, um, in my formation, I'm fortunate um, is that I was very much came of age and trained, raised up in a Black studies tradition that presumes right, that the practice of history, the writing of history is um, a political act, um, even as much of the profession would have had it otherwise. Um, and so, um, I think my work is part of a, a, a vast stream, a river, right? A sea of work that is um, undergirded by a concern for black humanity, for freedom, for power, um, for love, um, for um, a future or futures. Um, and within all that, we disagree a lot. <laughs> And it's important to say that that doesn't mean that we're all um, working, uh, you know, in precisely the same way or um, share the, the same the same interpretation or vision. But um, in this way, um, I think that um, while Black studies may not be distinct, um, I think it is or unique. It, it, it is distinct in in among the many spaces that one might work out of and through in the academy. Um, so for me, there's never been a necessity to um, respond to or um, uh, defend against the charge. And it oftentimes is a charge, right? That it's too political or that it is political at all, um, that it's supposed to be science or social science. Um, and, and for me, I just think black history doesn't suffer from that and actually opens the way for um, a necessary corrective um, for historians more broadly about where indeed the politics lie. And as I said earlier, we are seeing that on full display in the, um, in the vial and too often um, self-serving and baseless attacks on something like the 1619 Project. Um, uh, as if it were a slur um, that the project is out to not only um, narrate the past, um, but to remake the present. That's what Black history has always done, in my view. Thank you both so much for those answers. That was... I'm so sorry. You have time for one more. You have time for one more. 
one more. Oh, okay, cool. Um, <laughs> do we have any audience questions yet, or is everybody? No, is everybody evidently they are enjoying. This yeah. All right. I mean, we're having great conversations. No question. Okay. Let's do it. Um, so one more question I have. I'm gonna take. I'll just go ahead and read it. So returning back to the idea of reflecting on the past and its influence on the present and future, which is something both of y'all's work does like very often. Um, American culture doesn't put much emphasis on valuing your past or reflecting on memories and personal history. So there's kind of this there's this phenomenon of like social amnesia when it comes to American history and American culture and understanding how our country got to be where it is today. So based on the scope of y'all's work and the subjects you focus on, like, can we talk a little bit about the historical and social conditions that created this like social amnesia? I'll, I can jump in and say that um, one of the, the, the number one question I've been asked, I think, as I've toured around mm -hmm. from my seat, but I have toured around to talk about Vanguard. The number one question I get asked by people, and it is a heartfelt one, is um, why didn't I know this? Why didn't anybody teach me this? Mm -hmm. And um, and that comes from many kind of, many kind of folks, right? Not just black folks. It comes from all kinds of folks who recognize when you present to them something not only that's new, but that feels vital, that feels profoundly relevant about the past. And they begin to ask, what kind of education did I have, right? What kind of education did I have? Um, and uh, you know, there's a long answer, right, about the, the you know, what troubles and uh, our public education and the disinvestment in so much of public education history is just one facet of um, those things that we have abandoned or we have ceded. Um, but the other answer to the question, so there's an answer that has to do with K through 12 education. And I spend a lot of time uh, rewardingly with K through 12 teachers. Um, you know, wrestling with how to take the history I write and have it speak uh, through the curriculum, right, that um, K through 12 piece teachers are wrestling with. I think that's one piece. But the other piece is that I don't think we're unique as a nation in that we rest um, to an important degree on, on myths, um, it, 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 not so much on history. And, um, and part of my job is to bust myths, um, it's to challenge myths, um, it's to point out when myths are pernicious um, and undercut um, other kind of values that we might um, hold up or that we might aspire to. Um, but that is a hard business um, because um, uh, we all need, um, don't we? you know, sheroes, <laughs> we need women, you know, folks who, who do, right, inspire us um, and take us places. So I think about this a lot, right? And, and it's a question for my book, at least, you know, which is um, whether I have, um, you know, sort of really dismantled the myth or, you know, have I created an alternative pantheon of women, I call them the vanguard. That's very close to something like a pantheon uh, of black women. Now, I believe in my book, and I believe in that um, in that you know collection of, of um, women who come before us, who show us the way, who laid the foundation, and endured and risked a great deal to do so. Um, I believe in them. Um, but I want to leave room, I think, still for other folks to, you know, sort of have their sheroes too. Um, and uh, folks will have to read the book and tell me whether, you know, I, I strike the right balance, right, between uh, my profound admiration for the women about whom I write and my fidelity to um, some sort of critical sense of where they fit in in a historical record. 
Um, I leave others to judge that, but I know that that is something that I'm wrestling with in my work. And I'll, and I'll say, thank you for that, Dr. Jones. I'll say that I have a very cool, like, I have a very clear vision of, the, of how I want my work to operate right now. Um, I am definitely for changing the material conditions of this country. I am definitely for a radical redistribution of resources. I am definitely for reparations for descendants of slavery here in America. I am wholeheartedly for white people to finally, I don't know how it's supposed to happen. I wish there was a magic dust that could just sprinkle on all of us, but I am definitely for white folks to more, more than what we have now to fundamentally shift who they are. And what I mean by that is their systemic grip on everything. And I don't know how that's going to happen. But what I do know is that I will probably <laughs> fight to the death to, to at least make sure that I put a dent in the visual language that's coming out of our culture that's influencing um, the, the, here's the problem. So my, I'm going to be very personal. My, par my partner works in advertising. He, um, he, you know, t goes to museums, like Dr. Jones was saying, he gets inspired, he looks at, and then from that raw material that we produce, he makes advertisements, he makes uh, commercials, all these things. The museums are foundational to helping people understand the cultural myths that they believe in. And what I'm interested in is making sure that the museums are A, held accountable, B, are gonna populate it with, with, with material like Dr. Jones's book, that those should be in the bookstore. And then you should go in, first you should go get her book, then you should go see my work and see Simone's work and see, you know, a whole, whole Chloe's work at a whole, a whole host of artists. You should have to look at, you know, Elizabeth Catlett's work. And then you're going to have to go out and decide what kind of voter you're going to be, what kind of citizen you're going to be, how you, what does it mean to understand that this country, I mean, the country still can't grapple with the fact that it was built on a, the theft of land from indigenous populations and B, the enslavement of people for centuries, not just a five year period or 10 year period, centuries, we're talking hundreds of years. So for me, I'm trying to get, I mean, and I make a lot of work. I'm very like, I'm, you know, so for me, I'm really trying to hammer that in. And so every conversation that I have, I try to bring the sharpness that I have to the table to speak on that because ultimately I want the material conditions of this country to shift. And the only way they're going to do that is by busting up the myths and influencing a whole swath of people to, to understand the place that they live in and, and, and what, what is at stake, which is basically human lives. I'm going to do like a little shameless, not shameless plug, but I think, a, a great film to watch that was made, and I'm in the film, so I'm gonna say that, but um, is, a, is a film called Aggie. I think that if you see Aggie and you see this white woman with means, and you see her talking about how she's transformed, you know, she has means, like we're not, we, we're not confused, she has means, but what she does with those means and how her daughter captures the narrative of those means um, moving into other directions is, is something quite mystical and phenomenal. And we need Aggie is the guns family has done their thing. I'm not, you know, I'm not mad at them. They did their part. We need so many, we need the institutions to become Aggies. You know what I'm saying? We need like literally like Harvard to recognize slavery and recognize like it's, it's inheritances and like then advocate for reparations. We need the Museum of Modern Art to advocate for reparations. All of these types of things need to happen. 
because ultimately, so my work is really like, how can I get folks to change the material conditions here? What do I need to do? Is it through text work? Is it through photographs? Is it through painting? Is it through lectures? What? What's going to change? Oh, thank you very, both very much. And we're about out of time. So I want to say thank you to both of you um, for not only your work, but the way you spoke it today, which was wonderful. I also wanted, she's co-hosting, but I want to say thank you, Chloe, for your great questions right. and your enthusiasm. It, uh, it was, you know, yeah, for your first time, are you sure? Uh, this was this was great. You're you're better than a lot of people who do this uh, more often than you do. Um, I do want to have two pieces of housekeeping. Uh, part two will be with artists Karen Olivier and Stacy Kirby on October 29th at 4 p.m. And um, we will encourage all of you to vote. Um, and and we have some information on that. So again. Um, you know, friends, thank you very, very much. We could hear you in the audiences listening hard. Uh, we know that's why there were not questions. And thank you very, very much. Thank you all. And go see Aggie. It's in theaters. Go see it. Go see it. Aggie the film. Okay. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you. So thank much. you, Dr. Joe. Thank you.